invasive species. The term brings to mind an image of a plant, an animal, or an insect that lives in a place where it does not belong. But what determines where an organism should reside? How does it get to a place where it's considered invasive? And what effects does it have on the local ecosystem once it gets there? These are some of the questions we will try to answer today in the first episode of a new series where we talk about issues that impact local communities, global economies, and everything in between. This is Grow Light. Three years ago, when my wife and I first started the farm, we were struck by two things. One, the stunning views in central New Jersey, and two, the sheer number of trees on the property. We didn't know it at that time, but most of these trees are ash trees. In 1650, before colonization, most of the eastern United States was covered in tall forest. During the next 200 years, the forest disappeared particularly in New England, the Mid-Atlantic, and parts of the Midwest. By 1920, the tall forest was entirely gone, replaced by cities and farms. The late 20th century has been marked by heightened forest conservation efforts, leading to preservation of forests. However, North America's forests are now facing a different kind of an enemy. This time, the cause is not deforestation or urbanization. It's far more humble. Meet the Emerald Ash Borer, or EAB for short. First discovered in the early 2000s, the EAB is an invasive species that's native to Asia. And unfortunately for the ash trees, its diet consists entirely of the bark of ash trees. The insect burrows inside the softwood and lays eggs deep inside the trunk, where it gradually hollows out the tree, leaving telltale winding paths in its wake. The end result is absolutely devastating for the trees. Once a tree is infected by the EAB, its chances of survival are almost negligible, leading to this. We went to the Department of Entomology at Rutgers University and we spoke with Dr. George C. Hamilton an extension specialist in pest management and an expert in invasive insects. Hello, doctor. Hi. Nice, nice to meet, you, meet you. So what makes insect invasive and what causes insect invasions? Because a lot of people have a misconception about that. Most people think an invasive insect is something that's been introduced from outside, say, the United States. And that's not necessarily the case. Uh, we would refer to that insect as being a non-native versus a native insect. For a non-native, or in there are examples of native ones to become invasive, they have to come into the country or move from one part of the country to another part of the country and then cause some kind of ecologic or economic damage. The example of something that is native to the U.S is a southern pine beetle and it, 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 its larvae feed underneath the bark of pine trees and they kill the trees. Um, with climate change, those beetles have actually moved from the south all the way up into New Jersey. And we have them in the pine barrens now and they are killing trees down in the pine barrens. In agriculture, invasive species can have an, a very large effect depending on the <clears throat> insect and, and the crop that we're talking about. So one real good example is the brown marmorated stink bug. Um, it came into the United States in the mid-1990s over in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and now has spread to almost every state in the U.S. Uh, one wow. of the things that happens a, a good deal of the time when something comes in 
from someplace else is it doesn't come in with the things, the natural enemies that keep them in check, right. say in Asia, which is where the brown marmorated stink bug came from. Right. They get here, there's nothing here to control them, and so their populations can explode. And in the case of several of the species that have come in recently and have become large agricultural pests, they have a very wide host range. And so the, the brown marmorated stink bug feeds on over a hundred different host plants, and many of them are agricultural commodities, uh, specifically tree fruit and vegetables. The worst pests that I have dealt with in my entire career, uh, vegetable crops have been impacted significantly since about 2009. In the mid-Atlantic region, we have had crops such as sweet corn, fruiting vegetables such as peppers, tomatoes, okra, eggplant, all these crops have been have been hit hard. We have had some farms, for instance, that have had total loss of their vegetable crop. Another example would be the spotted wing drosophila, which is a fruit fly. Um, and it is a fruit fly that actually can lay its eggs in unripe fruit. And it also attacks a lot, and it's now a problem in, in all over the United States, including here in New Jersey. In this particular berry, just looking here, as I move this apart with a pen, I can probably see at least a half a dozen or a dozen maggots right in this area. Part of the problem is with this pest, when you go out and you pick your fruit, uh, it looks great on the vine or on the bush, and within a matter of maybe 24 hours with raspberries or two or three days with blueberries, they just start to turn to, to liquid. But not only are these insects causing damage to uh, the native tree populations, but also, you know, places where you wouldn't have normally seen an impact of these. For, for example, the lantern bugs that we have seen in the last few years, those, yes. those didn't tend to impact or, or affect vegetables. Uh, but now you're seeing that uh, some of the, the ones that you mentioned before have those. Uh, those have. So lantern fly is not actually a pest of vegetables. The only um, crop that there's been any real documented evidence of it being a problem is with wine grapes. And so, and that's because of the amount of fluid that they take out of the plants. They don't actually feed on the grapes themselves. They feed on the foliage and the, the vine. And that uh, in turn affects the grapes yes, eventually. Right, because either the, the vines die or right. they have reduced yield. We have been having invasions of invasive insects and other species since the first colonists came to this country. Right. And so it just keeps coming and coming. And, you know, they used to come over on wooden ships. Today they can get here in an airplane and they can get here very quickly in an airplane. Wow. And that's one of the things they have to be able to get here and survive. And then once they're here, they have to be able to survive and reproduce. Right. And that's what tends to cause the problem. And so global trade, mm -hmm. and, and you know, I'll blame it on humans. Right. As we've gotten better at moving things around the world, the insects have been able to move around the world as well. Brown marmorated stink bug is an example. It what we know it came from Beijing. Wow. Um, we did the DNA analysis comparing what's here to what's over in Asia. And the, what the first ones that got here came from China and they probably came in packing material. Uh, spotted wing drosophila is another one that's native to Asia and, and has come started on the west coast and then made its way to the east to coast, coast. In, in a relatively short time. Spotted lanternfly um, is an insect that actually has more of an ecological problem in areas like forested areas. Um, it feeds on a number of different tree hosts, and because it's a leaf hopper, it has sucking mouth parts. It's feeding on the the the, the phloem system in the plants. They take huge amounts of water through their system and they excrete most of it, and it has high sugar contents. The mold that grows in that, those deposits is called sooty mold, and it gets on the vegetation underneath the trees and can actually kill the vegetation because the mold doesn't kill it, but it interferes with photosynthesis, and so we see a decline in the understory in some areas 
where we have very, very large um, populations. Interesting. So it's not uh, always as evident as seeing um, an invasive species on a plant or a tree and you just flicking it off or you just killing it. The damage may ha have already been done by the time you get already, to it. Right, right. And so there, there's lots of evidence with that with, with the spotted lanternfly right. Uh, right here on campus. <laughs>the potential for things to come here from every everywhere else you know is is high um, and you know I'll, I'll be honest with you many of our agricultural pests weren't native to the United States they mm -hmm. came with people when they brought the crops here right. and so as we continue to do that um, we have the potential for for more pests to be coming in now people are checking uh, USDA APHIS Animal Health Plant Inspection Service. They do programs um, where they inspect cargo coming in. They do it at the Port of Elizabeth. They do it in Philadelphia and, and many other ports. Um, they also work with state departments of agriculture and they do that here in New Jersey where they have a list of insects and the Department of Ag, um, depending on their funding, um, go out and they do surveys looking for these insects. I see. Trying to get them before they become a problem. Not really. It has to be done at the government level. Uh, in my opinion, um, there are things that have to be done at places where they come from. And so a good example is emerald ash borer. It most likely came in packing wood packing material right. where they did not debark the wood and turned the wood inside the bark side in right. so that you couldn't see that it wasn't debarked. Um, we had another one, the Asian longhorn beetle um, where a similar thing. And it, that one was, was a problem with shade trees and uh, with four in possibly in the forest as, as well. And it was just as simple as they were supposed to debark it and they didn't. What does debarking mean? Uh, that means removing the bark from the, from the lumber. So when they rough cut it, there are pieces that still have the bark on it and they, need, they were, should have cut that off before they created the pallets or the, or the, the boxes, basically. I fine if you're going to do it on your own property but yeah actually with Europe with um, emerald ash borer uh, we are in a quarantine situation where firewood from this state or any other state um, that has been attacked by the emerald ash borer um, ash tree wood cannot be transported to any uh, to a state where it hasn't occurred yet and we do have, um, if you go camping, uh, you will potentially, at some campgrounds, say that you cannot bring your own wood. You have to buy the wood there, and so that's, the, that's the reason. And, and the reason is to keep it local so that it doesn't propagate. Right, uh, so it, it doesn't spread any farther. There, there are two, two wasps. They're... Um, the females of one of them lays her eggs in the eggs of the emerald ash borer and her young hatch and eat the inside of the egg out so there isn't one hatching. And the other one that they've introduced is another wasp where the female lays her eggs in the larvae of the emerald ash borer. They hatch and then they eat the insides out of the emerald ash borer and kill it. So biological warfare at the, uh, at the insect level. Yes. Yes. Fascinating. Closing note, is it as doom and gloom as uh, we have been led to believe uh, or is there, is there hope for us in the future? If we're careful and we don't bring more things in, um, we, we will probably be okay. Um, as long as we have things that we can do, if they get here, we'll probably be okay. Um, you mentioned emerald ash borer. I mean, we, we've now imported in, insects in to manage them, natural enemies. We were, they've been released here in New Jersey and in other states. As long as we're able to do those kinds of things and come up with programs, especially with farmers, that you know, 
they don't have to use massive amounts of insecticides to try and control these things. Um, we should be okay. Well, Dr. Hamilton, thanks a lot. And very enlightening. Explore other opportunities for us to, to interact, but this has sure. been very uh, interesting and, and very enlightening. Thank you so much. Yep, no problem. Whether you are a farmer or an office worker, a scientist or a layperson, one thing is abundantly clear. Climate change impacts us all, whether it's in the form of changing weather patterns or invasive insects. It is in our best interest to be responsible stewards of the planet so that we may continue to inhabit this for the foreseeable future. I hope this video was informative, useful and entertaining. Until next time.